As we've built the circular flow diagram, we've analyzed different parts of it in isolation. And all along the way, we've been doing what we call microeconomics. Now that we have the full circular flow diagram, we can ask, how does the system that's represented by this diagram evolve over time? And when we do that, we're doing macroeconomics. But before we can get there, we have to be really clear about what it is that we're measuring in this diagram and how things flow in the diagram. And the most important thing that we measure is what we call gross domestic product, or GDP. Now GDP is just the value of all final goods and services that are produced within a given country over some time interval. That time interval could be every three months, or every six months, or every year. And the government reports GDP on a quarterly basis every three months, and on an annual basis every year. Now when we first put up the circular flow diagram at the very beginning of the course, we said that you could actually see GDP on the left hand side of that diagram through all the purchases that are made in output markets for final goods and services. The people who make those purchases are households, firms, governments, and the rest of the world. So all we have to do to calculate GDP is to add up what households purchase, what firms purchase, what governments purchase, and what the rest of the world purchases. So we can begin with households and we call what households purchase consumption and denoted by C. So C stands for household purchases. With one important exception, we exclude from those purchases, so excluding residential housing. Now the reason that we exclude housing is because if you buy a house, you don't actually consume the services of that house this time interval, this quarter or this year. Instead, you're going to be consuming those services over a long period of time. And so instead of considering spending on purchases of housing as consumption, we consider it as investment. Now, you might make the argument that the same should hold for other kinds of durable goods. If you buy a washing machine, that washing machine might last for 25 years. So you certainly don't consume all the services of that washing machine in the current time period. But nevertheless, for other durable goods, we count those as current purchases. You could also think about spending on educational services, like the tuition that someone's paying for you to attend college. That spending could be argued to be an investment in human capital that's going to pay off over the rest of your life. But instead of treating it as an investment, we treat it and count it as a current household purchase. Now the second category is what firms do. Firms make what we call investments. So I stands for investments, but not for the kinds of investments that we often think of. Someone might ask you, how much have you invested in the stock market? What they're really asking is, how much have you saved in the financial markets? So that would appear somewhere else in the circular flow diagram. By investments, we mean business purchases. And of course, we have to add back in what we subtracted out on the consumption. So we have to say plus housing, residential housing purchases. Now, business purchases include the kinds of things that businesses purchase in order to make the kinds of goods they're going to sell to consumers. You might expand your factory. You might buy new equipment, computers. You might hire various services to help you produce the kinds of goods you're going to ultimately sell to consumers. Those are all business purchases that we consider investments. We also consider investments to be building up of inventories. So if you're filling up your warehouse with inventories, that's an investment. Now, when you sell those inventories to consumers, that'll appear under consumption 
and will be subtracted back out of investments. The third category of purchases are the purchases that governments make. We denote those as G. So G stands for government purchases. And by government, we mean all forms of government. The federal government, state governments, local governments, school boards, all forms of governments. Whatever they purchase in output markets is counted under G. So when the government pays a teacher or a serviceman or a firefighter or a police officer, they are buying a service. And so that's counted as G. But when the government writes a social security check or an unemployment check, that doesn't buy any service. That's simply a transfer and would appear here in the circular flow diagram. So that wouldn't count as G. So it's important to realize that G doesn't stand for government spending. It stands for government purchases of goods and services. And a lot of what the government spends is on goods and services, but a lot of it is also on transfers that the government makes. Now the final category is what the rest of the world does, which we've called net exports. So net exports is equal to exports minus imports. So why do we include that in GDP? Well, let's start with exports. Exports are goods that are produced in this country, but they're not consumed in this country. The government isn't purchasing them, the businesses aren't purchasing them, and households aren't purchasing them. Instead, they're consumed by people in the rest of the world. So these are goods produced here, so we want to count them in GDP, but they haven't been counted in any of those other categories, so we have to add them. What about imports? Imports are goods that we purchase from the rest of the world. They were not produced here, but they are purchased here. Either households or businesses or the government purchases imports. imports. But since they weren't produced here, we don't want to include those in GDP. Since we've already counted them in these categories, we have to subtract them back out. So now we have those four categories of GDP. Consumption, plus investment, plus government purchases, plus net exports. And when we say GDP, we almost always mean real GDP as opposed to what we call nominal GDP. Nominal GDP has not been adjusted for inflation, whereas real GDP has been adjusted for inflation. So imagine that the country is producing exactly the same things this year as it did last year, but prices have gone up. If we calculate this year's GDP at current prices and last year's GDP at last year's prices, we would get an increase in GDP but that's an increase in nominal GDP. In real terms, production hasn't changed. So when we adjust for inflation and we measure what's being produced at the same prices in both years, we would get the same number and that's real GDP. And real GDP is oftentimes denoted by Y. So we're gonna often write that Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus NX, whereby Y we mean real GDP.